creating something that was going to be an heirloom piece that was going to be passed down you know, through, through generations that, that people would love and cherish and that would really be a centerpiece in their home. But, you know, seeing it in the homes, uh, you know, seeing it being used, it's, it's special and it doesn't, uh, I, I don't take that lightly. It's the kind of thing where, you know, it's not just a piece that we're working on. We see it for a couple of weeks, but the idea that it still lives on and people have, you know, real, it adds meaning to life is everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. I recently had the opportunity to travel to St. Louis for work, and while I was there, I was able to visit one of the Barolo tables in the home of the Petker family. This project has meaning for me on a number of different levels. Most notably, it was a challenge of scale and execution that I had never undertaken before, and the first two tables were made during a difficult year of my life. Hi, y'all. We're at St. Louis. <laughs> Things had not turned out the way I planned or the way I had hoped, and here was a chance to prove to myself what I was really capable of. I have done the turning for four of these tables. Each one had its own particular set of challenges, whether it was figuring out how to lift and mount the blank for the first one, trying to find the right help so that I wasn't turning something this dangerous alone, or trying to get these pieces turned in a limited amount of time and over the holidays. I was continually questioning my process to make it safer and more efficient. The first table was made of ash and then ebonized. I turned the pedestal for this table, but not the foot. The second table was made of cherry. The blank was glued up at Goebel Furniture in St. Louis and then shipped to Charleston for me to turn. Although I was shipped the blank for the foot, it was too unstable and unsafe to turn. Something this large could kill me in an instant if the wood failed. So, in the interest of timing, I had to turn the foot in St. Louis. The third table was walnut, and for that one, Martin and his friend James drove the blanks from St. Louis with the plan of making a video about the entire process of the Barolo table. The fourth table was also made of walnut, and it had to be turned over Thanksgiving week last year. So it was tough to find anyone to be here with me. For safety reasons, I don't like to turn something this large without someone else around, just in case anything should go wrong. Luckily, I was able to find a friend at the last minute. A lot of people don't have the opportunity to see how a piece like this is made, so I think it's important to start from the beginning. It starts with the tree. Missouri is home to some of the most commonly used hardwoods for furniture making, white oak and walnut in particular. The Goebel Furniture Team is able to use locally salvaged lumber, trees that were due to come down for one reason or another, to create many of their pieces, including the Barolo table. But harvesting lumber is not a simple, easy, or fast process. <laughs> First, the log has to be milled, and these boards are left a little extra thick compared to the usual, commercially available kiln-dried lumber. Then the milled boards need to dry. Trees are full of water when they're first cut, and the trick is to get the wood dry without losing too much material due to cracking and warping. Each board gets sealed at the ends to prevent the ends from drying too quickly and cracking, and the boards get stacked with stickers or strips of wood in between to allow air to flow through the stack. These boards need to air dry for up to two years before they're ready to become a piece of furniture. 
Once the lumber is dry, it needs to be milled using the joiner and planer so that it is perfectly flat and true on both sides. It also gets cut down to the appropriate sized pieces to glue up. The second, third, and fourth table have stave style glue ups for the pedestal. This means that the blank looks like a pie, and in this case, a 12-sided pie. Each piece of the pie is made of six layers of walnut glued together. Once these layers are glued together, they're cut roughly to shape on the bandsaw. And here you can see how they're going to fit together. The accuracy of this glue up is crucial. As I mentioned, a piece this large could potentially kill a person immediately if it comes apart while it's on the lathe. And while I do everything I can to mitigate the dangers, there's still a significant amount of centrifugal force while it's spinning on the lathe. It has to be dead on, no pun intended. So these pieces are each CNC cut in order to assure the accuracy and a perfect fit. They use a notch running down the piece to fit a small piece of wood that will help locate the pieces of the pie against each other. And there is a piece that gets inserted over the hollow center at each end so that I can mount it on the lathe. It's all hands on deck when this glue up goes together so that everything can be tight and perfect before the glue starts to dry. And then it's off to Charleston. Now, I am not about to lift this 300-pound behemoth out of the van on my own. I've got an engine hoist for that, and we put a recess into the blank for the foot of my faceplate as an added level of safety. Because the pedestal is designed to fit the maximum capacity of my Vickmart lathe at 23 inches, the corners need to be planed off before it will even begin to turn. I decided to rough turn the foot first since the wood will start to move as I cut it down to size. If I did all of the turning at once, it would change shape after I was finished, which is not conducive to a dining table that we want to sit flat. The plan is to take off some of the material and let this piece rest for a couple of days while I work on the pedestal. I have two Vickmart lathes, so we would be able to speed things up by having Martin sand the pedestal on the one lathe while I worked on the foot on my other lathe. Now best laid plans and all, things did not go according to plan. About five minutes into rough turning the foot, the inverter dies on one of these lathes, leaving us with just the one large enough for this project. And the boys need to be back in St. Louis in a few days. So we'll come back to that. The pedestal blank goes onto the lathe in the same way it came out of the van, with my engine hoist. Similar to the foot, we have mounted a faceplate into a recess that was created at the end of a blank for a little extra safety. We created a hole on the opposite side for my live center for the same reason. I want to get this piece into the chuck as quickly as possible, so it's only between centers long enough for me to turn a tenon, and then we spin the piece around again to grip it with my chuck. So once we turn the lathe on, I have to start it turning very, very slowly because it is a large blank and even though we did everything that we possibly could to make sure that it was well balanced and it was round, it's still going to be a little bit off until I get the entire surface of the piece turned. So I started with the lathe slow with a roughing gouge to skim the surface and get it down to round. And then starting at this end using a 5 8 full gouge, I started to remove some of the material. So this is of course nowhere close to what it's going to look like. It's sort of uh, making a number of roughing cuts to remove some of the, the bulk of the material that's not going to be needed on the piece. So he sent me the drawings and I thought, okay, there's, there's no problem with me turning that shape. Um, all, of the, all of the forms, the curves, everything, um, everything that was in that shape was something that I was comfortable working with. Um, I do have to admit at this point in time though that I hadn't actually turned anything that big yet. 
he heard about me through some of his contacts in the furniture world. Um, I, I think somebody that I had turned some table legs for before, a guy named Brian Boggs, um, had given Martin my name. And I think he looked at a number of different turners uh, and a number of different avenues for getting this job done. And um, he decided to go with me. Ashley came really highly recommended from a gentleman named Brian Boggs, a legend within the furniture world. So we created a number of files for her. She printed them out in full scale. She took our digital precision and brought that into the physical world just with handcraft. And we knew we had the right person for the team. I called my mentor, who's been turning longer than I've been alive, and I asked if he had any recommendations for, for tackling such a massive project. And we talked about it and, and figured out a few things that would help to make it possibly a little bit easier and definitely safer. And at the end of the conversation, he said, you know, Ashley, I've never turned anything this big. The Barolo table was not something I could have possibly attempted in the first few years I'd been turning. It was a challenge in every way. It was a challenge in logistics, from scheduling, to moving the blank, to mounting the blank, and taking it off again without dinging it. It was a challenge in skill and strength. Because these pieces have to turn so slowly in order to turn safely, it is more difficult to hold the gouge steady on the tool rest. And with the third one, my outboard tool rest was not tall enough and had to be on a platform which made it bounce around more. Another added challenge. And then there was the level of courage that I have to find to turn the lathe on with a piece like this. Anyone should be a bit afraid of turning on this scale. And while I made every effort to turn these tables as safely as possible, it was still a bit scary. I remember telling Tyler, who was working with me on the first table, that I was scared to turn the lathe on after we spent an entire day figuring out how to mount it. I mentioned that this was a tough year in my life, and while I was proving to myself that I could tackle this massive undertaking, I was encouraged by people watching from all over the world. This was my introduction to Instagram. I didn't have an account of my own at the time, but it was incredible to see how many people were following along through the Gobel Furniture feed. It was a testament to the positive impact and the reach that social media can have. I like to think that this project showed that you don't have to have a state-of-the-art workshop or be large in stature to create something on this scale. I have only turned four Barolo tables and will not be working on any more. But the stories of these four were seen by tens of thousands of people. Remember how I mentioned that the inverter had failed and left us with one lathe? Well, um, I had to figure out how to get these pieces done in time for the guys to head back to St. Louis. I got this idea that I had never seen anyone else do before to mount both the pedestal and the foot on my one working Vic Mark at the same time. One inboard and one outboard. That way, Martin could work on scraping and sanding the pedestal while I finished turning the foot. And luckily, it worked. <laughs> You can see here how much the wood has moved over a couple of days. I start by truing up what will be the bottom of the foot, and this helps to get the piece balanced. It also helps me to determine what the thickness of the final piece will be, and Martin started working on power sanding the pedestal.
We decided that the cove needed to be perfected a little in order to have the smoothest curve. One of the challenges with the first three tables was working with straight tool rests, which had a limited reach inside of this super large cove. So Martin got the crash course on negative rake scraping, an easy and effective way to smooth out some of the inconsistencies in the curve so that I could go back to shaping the foot. For the fourth table, I had some custom tool rests made by Robus that made this job way easier. They made one for the large cove that was exactly the same curve so that I didn't have to constantly move around and switch out straight tool rests in order to reach the surface. They made another straight tool rest that fit my Oliver outboard stand so that I could have more height adjustment and not have to use the wooden platform underneath the stand that compromised my stability. And of course the OG curve on the foot needed to be perfect as well, so we had both sets of eyeballs to check before perfecting the form. We put a coat of oil on these turnings before they went back to St. Louis in order to minimize the wood movement before it went through final finishing back at Goebel Furniture. It is such a satisfying feeling to watch that grain come to life. And a couple final touch-ups with a negative rake scraper. A bit of final scraping and sanding on the foot. One final pass along the bottom of the foot to make sure it sits flat. And the foot is ready for a coat of oil. The tabletop gets created back at Goebel Furniture. Don't worry, I am not about to put an 80 inch round on my lathe. This is their shop manager, Jason Dacus, routing and shaping the tabletop. After it's cut to size, the tabletop gets sanded and the bottom of the tabletop is rough shaped with a router.
After final surfacing and sanding, the top is ready for finish. Back to my recent trip to St. Louis. The Petkers have the most beautiful home that I'm seeing for the first time. Every detail was considered with as much handcrafted detail as possible in every room. So the last time I saw this pedestal was when I put it in a crate to ship uh -huh. it off. Uh -huh. That was it. it. It came off with a lathe on an engine hoist. Mm -hmm. um, I had another guy that was working with me at the time. So Tyler and I put this thing in a crate and had it picked up and, and shipped off. And then the foot, I actually turned the foot for the table here in St. Louis. Okay. Oh, that's right. I remember that. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And there, there actually, I think there is a video out right now of the... Um, of the foot being turned, or part of the foot being turned, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, so... Um, that video ended up having like a million and a half people watch it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, literally, I think it was 1.2, 1.3 million people watched her turn the base of your table. Uh -huh. Yeah. <laughs> when it came time for us to pick up, to find a piece, a dining room table that would fit in this, in this space, mm -hmm. uh, we, we, I came to Mark, mm -hmm. and, and this is what, what you all produce. Mm -hmm. This is gorgeous. We love it. Yeah, we do. We get so many compliments <laughs> from uh, people that, you know, that you know, they go, wow. <laughs> it was a fun one. We, uh, uh, you, you can't just go to anybody to have a turning that large, right? Right. right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the kind of thing where a lot of people look at you and just the thing will break their machine and it probably would. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I called Ashley probably, I don't know, four years ago when we were trying to figure out how to do something of this magnitude. And I had gotten her name from another gentleman that was also really respected in the woodworking world. And there's maybe three people in, in the world that would actually do this. Uh -huh. And then I talked to her and it's doing it. Yeah, we had never met in person when he hired me to turn the first one. Uh -huh. really? Yeah, we had never met, he so called me up. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I remember um, he said, so I have this idea for this table. And I said, okay. And he said, it's really big turning. I want to do a pedestal base. You know, can you do this? And I said, well, how big is it? And he said, how big can you make it? <laughs> so, I said, well, uh, here's the capacity of my lathe. And he goes, okay, that's what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> wow. That's yeah. amazing. Traditionally, We've gotten together, uh, the whole family would get together, most of the family, get together for Thanksgiving and for Christmas. And since we've moved in, we've hosted Christmas every year. And so we'll have a hundred you know, or so people here. So this table will be full yeah. of people uh, enjoying Christmas dinner. <laughs> I'm just glad I found Ashley to do it. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd really have a tall order. <laughs> We love the fact that we have a unique piece. Mm -hmm. Not many people do. No, no. Many <laughs> It just, it couldn't have a better place to live. Mm -hmm. It's so cool to see it in here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for letting us come in here. You're welcome. But, um,
I mentioned that Martin Goebel and his friend James came to Charleston to create a video about the third Barolo table. Sadly, James passed away a few weeks after shooting this footage. This video is dedicated to the memory of James Dixon. Thank you for watching.